Howdy guys and gals, I'm Kyle Broderick and you've stumbled into the lair of the social regressive. I've gotten a lot of requests over the past couple of years to check out the Savage Stealth, especially the 6.5 Creedmoor model. And Savage, thankfully, was able to send me this. This is not just a Savage Stealth, this is the Savage Stealth Evolution. This is the new model that adds a few extras that are going to make this a bit more ergonomic, expand some of the capabilities, probably increase, increase the weight by a good bit too. But uh, overall, I think this is a much more capable rifle. We're gonna be digging into this. Uh, over the, the past couple of weeks, I have been shooting several challenges. I've shot uh, what we call the unknown distance challenge with a couple of friends where we took clay pigeons and put them out at unknown distances. And then using the rifle's uh, scope reticle, we had to figure out the distance to the target and then shoot it and you know out to anywhere up to 425 yards. It's a pretty difficult challenge and it's a whole lot of fun. And it's a great match for a rifle like this that's as precise as it is. I also went out with a plan to shoot some eggs at 300 yards like I've done with some rifles in the past, but I actually forgot the eggs and when I got to the range I had to figure something out really quickly. So I put some clay pigeons out at 650 yards. This was a very difficult shoot. I think it's more difficult than the eggs. The conditions were a little bit difficult. It was very, very cold, so I had to wear some thick gloves while I shot. And there was some wind going on, gusting up to about 15, so not too shabby. But still, pretty difficult challenge, and you can see where I missed, where I hit, and you can see how close the misses were. With these two challenges completed and a little bit of extra trigger time for myself and with my friends, I'm ready to call it good. This rifle is fantastic. It is well worth the cost. This costs about 1400 bucks. I think right now you might end up paying a little bit more, a little bit less for this, but it is absolutely worth it. It is a very precise, very fine rifle. I have had just a, a lot of fun shooting this thing. Uh, very comfortable in the prone because of some of these upgrades and we're gonna take a real close look at all the bits right here So that we can kind of get an understanding of how this thing works and what it's really designed for before we start digging in though I just want to again thank the various folks that have made this happen. Thanks to all my friends that have come out and shot uh, you got Billy and Cole and uh, Kyle and Jesse and all just just a bunch of great guys good shooters and just a lot of fun to hang out with We had a really good time and uh, also, of course, I just have to thank uh, Savage for sending this thing out. It's really nice that I can get this loaner. And I also thank you to the, uh, the patrons of the Destructive Arts out on Patreon. Thanks a bunch of you guys for making this happen. Thank you, Denver Loveless. Okay, so let's dig right in and let's see how this thing works. Let's start by talking about the design of this rifle because I think it is quite attractive. There are a lot of industrial things out there, cars, guns, other things like that, that they look good to us because we know their function, but they don't necessarily have any kind of artistic beauty to themselves. And I think this one starts to incorporate more of the art. Uh, you get all these really neat angles going through the, uh, the cheek piece here, back here on the buttstock, the grip. You get these kind of forward raked angles going all through the stock up here in this kind of hand grip area up to the front of the hand guard. Uh, it really feels like the whole thing is kind of leaping forward. It feels very dynamic. Uh, I like it a whole lot. It starts to feel more like sports car and less like sand rail. While this does deviate from the classical ideas of beauty and firearms, like with really nice walnut, engraving, gold and silver, and that sort of thing, I think that this is still a very interesting slice in time to kind of show some of the things that we favor in kind of more of the modern world. It's like this exhibit that I went to that went through some of the uh, Art Deco influences in industrial design, and they had things like toasters and all kinds, you know, record players, things like that. And it really did illustrate the beauty in very usable, functional things. I think that this is one that eventually might hang on a wall somewhere, if you can keep this in stock formation, to just kind of show how things were at the time in kind of the 2010s. Most of the beauty and functionality of the rifle come from this MDT chassis right here, branded Savage, 
and it includes some really neat parts like this new kind of top cover for the handguard. It used to be with the, well, with the Savage Stealth that's out there right now, the, the kind of baser model, uh, it just has this kind of under tray here and the barrel sits on top. You now get a lot more rail space, so if you want to run uh, either irons actually, if you want to put backup irons on a uh, bolt action rifle, you can do it on this one, and you can run things like night vision out here if you want to put some of the stuff that comes before the scope. Uh, you just get a whole lot more space out here. The rail that you see sitting on top of the action that the scope is on, that's actually a separate piece and you can see the join right here. So if you want to lighten up your rifle, you can actually take this part of the handguard off. You can just take the top part off completely and you can uh, maybe save yourself a little weight for a backpacking trip or something. Uh, you can remove that just by taking these screws off right here. And while we're taking a look at the handguard, let's take a look at uh, some of the, the ways that you can attach things. This does come with two uh, Savage logoed rails, one on each side, uh, Picatinny, and it does have a QD stud on each of these. All you have to do is just back these out. These are M-Lock, and there is M-Lock space down on the bottom as well. And then there's one QD stud up at the front for attaching a bipod. Very handy to have all this stuff available. One of the surprising things about this rifle is how easy it is to carry and how excellent its balance is. The balance point is essentially right through here where this grip is. So if you just wrap your fingers around this thing and carry it around, it becomes extremely comfortable to move from spot to spot. The oversized trigger guard looks cool, but it's also functional. This is very large and it can accommodate some very thick gloves, as I found out when I was shooting those 650 yard clay pigeons down in the single digits, or however cold it was out there. Nestled in here is the AccuTrigger, and this one is tuned to two pounds right now. Perfectly crisp, as you might expect. Moving forward, we have the Magwell. This uses MDT magazines. It's very easy to eject. It's a pretty tight aperture when you go to put these things back in, but it locks up very solidly, which is nice. Now, one thing that I found out is that these magazines that I ran in the GRS, these are Magpul uh, PMAG 10 round magazines. These do not fit in here. I figured that since everything was kind of Accuracy International compatible, turned out I was wrong on that point. Um, this seems to be its own kind of thing. This works with this chassis and the Magpul magazines and probably some of the other AI ones don't. You might want to go do some research and see what magazines you can fit in this thing. The pistol grip is a Hogue rubber over molded model. This has a pretty severe backward rake. It has finger grooves. And I was expecting this not to really work all that well. I was expecting to want to swap it over to something more vertical. I think overall I still do, but I was really surprised at how comfortable this thing was when I was shooting. Uh, I really just didn't have any issues with this thing. It felt very natural, very comfortable. This has a pretty nice palm swell going on right here. And I found that in the shooting that I was doing that it was very uh, stable, comfortable. I liked it. The Magpul PRS Gen 3 buttstock that they decided to put on this thing is my favorite upgrade over the other Stealth. The 10BA and the 110BA, the big old rifles that had those huge chassis, that was one of the neatest things that I found about those was that they had the Magpul PRS, a great adjustable stock uh, and rather heavy, putting the weight more toward the back. This is getting back to that formula and I love it. You want that weight toward the back and you want all these adjustable parts like you see here. The whole thing feels very, very solid. You get a nice smooth rail here at the bottom. This actually has some M-lock sections, but this is also going to ride a rear bag extremely well. You get lots of adjustment on the cheek piece and on the butt pad, and the Gen 3 is where you start to add some of the awesomeness that I was really looking for in a, a butt stock on a precision rifle. You get the ability to move this butt pad up and down by loosening two screws back here. You can move this thing up and down, and you can cant it like I have here. You can see that this thing is kind of offset. It's at an angle, and it's going to fit my body a whole lot better. It does make this thing much more comfortable to shoot than your average M4 or M16 style buttstock. Now we're getting into the meat and potatoes. What makes this a precision rifle? 
this action right here is not your normal Model 10 action. This is more like the target action that you can buy separately. This one has a top strap going all the way across, so you should get more rigidity than even with that Model 10 GRS, which has the usual open top action. Combine that with, of course, the wonderful bolt that you usually get with its floating bolt head the blueprinting that they did from the factory on this, so everything should be lined up and very precise. You get a little bit of a tighter chamber here than with the Model 10 GRS, and it looks like they put in an extra thick recoil lug. All of this is going to add up to a very precise setup all through here. Moving forward, you have the barrels, and you're going to have a choice of different chamberings here. Uh, you should go take a look at the catalog because I'm sure it will change over time. But what this is, this is kind of a varmint taper that's been fluted. And in this case, since I have a 6.5 Creedmoor, this is a 24 inch barrel. All of them are going to be 24 inches, including the, uh, the 338 Lapua Magnum and the 300 Win Mag. The only variations are going to be the 223, which has a 20 inch barrel. And then you have the six millimeter Creedmoor, which has a 26. And I really like that they put a longer barrel on that six millimeter Creedmoor because it's going to really like moving out very fast. One of the best things about this barrel is something that you can't actually see. This has 5R rifling and a 1 and 8 twist. That means that this is going to handle some very heavy bullets, which is going to be great for your long range shooting. And that kind of applies to all of the guns that are being offered in the Stealth series. They all have a pretty high twist rate, so you can handle extra heavy bullets. The final part we'll take a look at is the muzzle brake. This is not a huge muzzle brake. It's not one of these tank style. It sticks way off. You can see that it's not all that much bigger than the barrel itself. Despite that, it is effective and efficient. This is going to keep your rifle pretty much stationary so that you can see your impacts after you take a shot. I really liked how it works. There is one kind of quirk about it though. If you have to remove this thing, you have to use a 15 16 wrench, which is not the most common out there. Or maybe you can get yourself a really big crescent or something, but uh, I'll tell you this, it takes a lot of torque to remove this. There was some kind of thread locker under here, and it does take a pretty good uh, twist to get this thing off. How does it all add up? What are the practical results? Well, first we're gonna take a look at this ammunition right here, Federal American Eagle 140 grain open tip match. I did not shoot a group with this stuff, even though it was the best factory ammo that I put through this rifle. This stuff is really good, the price is good, go out and buy it. If you have a 6.5 Creedmoor with a 1 and 8 twist, I'm serious, go buy it. This stuff is much better than it should be. I know the American Eagle line is supposed to be kind of inexpensive, but really, I've always had good luck with this stuff, and especially with this. This shoots very tight. I would estimate that with this, I was typically shooting at about three quarter MOA or smaller. And one of the reasons why I don't have any targets for you to look at is I just plain shot this stuff. I wanted to shoot steel, I wanted to shoot clay pigeons. So when you see us nailing some of these targets out at longer ranges, we're using this ammo to really good effect. Not just putting holes in paper, I mean, we are just blowing stuff away. Great ammo. Now, we did have some problems with the uh, GRS the, the Model 10 GRS, it did not like this ammo, Federal Gold Metal Burger, uh, 130 grain Burger hybrids in there, it didn't like that ammo very much. Things did tighten up, you can see that it's still not exactly spectacular, this stuff was still shooting better, it was definitely sub MOA. But uh, yeah, the Federal Gold Metal Burger, uh, the rifles just didn't really like it. You can see that this one is hovering just slightly over one MOA. It's really right around that one MOA mark. It's good, but really this stuff back here is better. Now, from there, I did actually shoot one target with the 6.5 Creedmoor with the, uh, uh, the, the Federal American Eagle stuff, but it's a little bit different. Take a look at this. This is one of my full-size human silhouette targets, and this was shot at 600 yards, not by me, but by friend of the channel, Jesse. He's been in a few of the videos, and I have some footage of him here shooting steel, uh, steel silhouettes and a steel plate way back there. And he shot this with the Federal American Eagle 140 grain stuff. And look at this. That group fits easily within my hand at 600 yards. We were shooting a Stealth Evolution, Savage Stealth Evolution today. Uh, I really think as far as a uh, the appearance is unbelievable uh, with this design here. 
and the full railing on both sides. Uh, shootability of it is very easy for anybody, any level of shooter really. Uh, the bolt action works super smooth, the blueprinted action. I noticed it's smoother than my Savage 10 FCPR. Uh, we've got a fluted barrel. Uh, it shot really, really well. Feels really good in the hand. The modular stock is very, very uh, ergonomic. Uh, I did have a chance to carry it a little bit, Kyle, you know, just around down there and stuff. And it feels great just carrying it. Uh, I believe the weight uh, is a little bit heavy, uh, but it is not uh, past being able to hunt with it either because I've hunted with rifles that are weight just so heavy. This one uh, holds accuracy at its weight, so that's another good value. I love the Magpul. Uh, the adjustability right here of it is really comfortable. Um, all in all, uh, a shooter, competition gun, light competition shooter, whatever, uh, it uh, fills all those uh, tickets. So uh, really, really good rifle. Really liked it. The, the Bushnell Elite HD MR2, uh, the horse, it is a horse reticle. Mm -hmm. It is unbelievable. Uh, you would call me out the mills and it was easy to find in the scope. Uh, it's just easy to count, 4.4 mils and then your hold, real easy to hold. Uh, as far as hunting or competition hold, anything, this, this scopes the ticket. Uh, I like it a lot better than my, uh, the scope I'm using, so made it real easy. I've been working up some hand loads through the Stealth Evolution, and we're going to take a look at actually some of the failures first. This is using 140 grain spear hot core bullets, and I wanted to see if I could put together a good hunting load. So what we have here, I'm going to take you through some of the groups. This is using the optimized charge weight method. So there's string number one. You can see that it is sub MOA. This one opens up to about one and a half. This one's getting down more toward one MOA. And then right here we have this. It's actually a pretty large group, but look at the vertical spread. We can attribute some of the uh, horizontal here just to the wind because it was a pretty windy day when I shot this. Um, but yeah, total vertical is very, very interesting. Up here, we have a one and a half inch group for the next charge, and things just kind of stay pretty large. Number seven looks like it's heading somewhere, but uh, yeah, I never did uh, do a charge that was hotter than that one. It seemed like that one was kind of the max charge. So let's move on to something that has been working a little bit better. I'll be breaking out a little 6.5 Creedmoor hand loading series using the Evolution, but for now let's just take a look at some of the results that I got real quick. This is with the same 140 grain hot core bullets using Alliant Reloader 16, which uh, as far as I can tell it's going to be a really nice powder. Uh, so there's group number one, you can see a lot of vertical stringing, it's definitely not the node that we're after. Number two, Number three, starting to get a little bit interesting here. That's a little bit over one MOA. And then four, this is the one that I think I'm going to be sticking with. Uh, this came in at 0.64 inches with a, you know, just a lead spire point style bullet. Uh, so yeah, not too shabby at all. 0.83 right there, and then things start to open up even more on the, uh, the sixth charge. So yeah, I think that... Uh, I think we have a, a winner right here. This is going to be a very nice hunting load. It's going to be a good bullet for expansion, and it looks like it's going to be remaining pretty darn tight. Next up, these are Hornady 140 grain BTHP match. So there's string number one, two, three. Oh yeah, we're starting to get into some tighter territory here, 0.9. And then string number four. We're looking at a little over a half inch right there. And I put that it felt different because this was uh, this is the first time I've ever noticed this. It's almost like the barrel hummed every time I took one of these shots. Like even if I had taken one of these shots in the dark, didn't know what uh, load I was shooting, I think I would have been able to tell, okay, that's that number four. It was really strange. I got kind of this vibration back through the gun. Really weird, but yeah, nice and tight. A Little bit smaller than three quarter MOA there. And then, yeah, up toward 0.9. Now we're dealing with the Hornady ELDM 140 grain. And take a look at this. These are the ciders, which are actually just kind of almost random powder charges way down low. Uh, these are very disparate. And look at that, it shot a clover leaf. 
How cruel is that? The other stuff isn't going to be quite that tight. <laughs> so it makes me wonder if I need to back down to really find the next node. Uh, but yeah, a bit over one MOA. Starting to tighten up. Yeah, down here things are starting to get pretty tight. This is the one that I think I'm going to go with because I'm going to assume that this one was a drop in the wind. We had a very stiff breeze. We're talking about like 20 miles an hour across the, uh, the range. And I know that there were certain points where the wind would just suddenly die. I'm going to attribute this to the wind. Um, and you can see that even though the, the group overall was 0.89 inches, the total vertical spread was less than 0.1. So yeah, I think this one's going to be uh, my huckleberry. Next up, 0.85. A little bit smaller than 3 quarter. And then heading back upward again. To wrap this review up and put a neat bow on it, let's talk about the purpose of this rifle and some of its competitors. This rifle is meant to be shot supported. It wants to be on a bipod, a tripod, a rest, a barricade, a rock, a bench, something. This is just a little too heavy, especially out at the muzzle, to be shooting this thing offhand. Unless you're, you know, really in a pinch and your target is pretty large. It's just going to be pretty wobbly. Uh, even though it does have that nice balance that I talked about and has this nice hand grip, that I think is just there for when you grab the rifle and move to your next supported spot. And when you get to that supported spot, that's when the weight is going to be a huge help to you, especially back here on this uh, buttstock. This is going to feel very planted, not just before you take the shot, but actually after you take the shot, and uh, coupled with that muzzle brake, you're going to be able to see your impacts. Uh, this is a wonderful rifle to get behind. It just drives straight back into your shoulder, just barely moves, and then you can see your bullet actually impact your target. Let's take a look at the competition because there really is a lot out there. Pretty much everybody is making a chassis rifle nowadays. It's going to sit at the top of all the rifle manufacturers' catalogs. It's going to cost a whole lot. And even in that field of what look to be excellent rifles, this one really does stand out. For one thing, it feels like a unified whole. Just looking at it and looking at its various, uh, you know, kind of forward rakish angles, it looks like it's purposeful. It looks like it was all kind of designed together. It also just feels that way when you get behind this and start shooting. Everything complements everything else and everything is just kind of squared away and in its right place. You have the nice savage action with its floating bolt head mated to that blue printed action right here. You have the 24 inch barrel with the 5R rifling, nice muzzle brake. The grip is just what it should be. The buttstock back here was just a brilliant choice. It feels overall very comfortable, very easy to get behind and start taking your shots. And like I mentioned, even when it comes to the visuals, it really does kind of come off as a whole integrated rifle, maybe something you could even kind of hang on the wall as at least a, a slice in time versus just parts that were put together. And those parts, really the only thing that I can kind of see people maybe wanting to swap would be this grip right here. This is the only kind of controversial bit that I can see. Uh, this, just because of its, its backward rake, some people might prefer that more vertical grip like I tend to, but really everything else seems to be just fine, including that muzzle brake. I know a lot of people like are very choosy about what they put out on the muzzle, but that thing, it just works and it looks nice. The competitor that most people want me to compare the Savage Evolution to is actually still within the Savage catalog, and that's the Savage Model 10 GRS. Since I've had the opportunity to shoot both rifles with the same ammunition, with the same friends, in the same field, at the same targets, I think I have a pretty fair idea of the differences between them and some of the similarities. As far as similarities go, uh, they both have that 24 inch fluted barrel, they're both very precise, uh, they both of course have that nice savage action and all that, but when it comes to sheer comfort, you gotta go for the Savage Model 10 GRS. The GRS Berserk stock is wonderful, and a lot of it just comes down to that grip that's offset and canted so that all of the bones in your hand when you're down prone, they just line up very nicely. You don't get any of this wrist kinking stuff. It's very easy to, be, to be behind that rifle for long periods of time. It just feels like you just lay your hand naturally on it. 
your trigger finger is on the trigger, your hand is in the right position, everything just feels nice. And you're going to get a little bit of a different feel with some of the, uh, the ambidextrous nature of a chassis rifle and the AR parts that you're going to get there. Still going to feel really good, but really the GRS is just a step above everybody else right now. When it comes to the action, the action of the GRS is also slicker in my opinion. With that accurate mag bottom metal and these 10 round P mags, it ran extremely smoothly. I would say that the action is the same between them, but I think something about the magazine in the GRS just made everything run a little bit slicker. Feeding was really easy. Everything was just plain fingertippy. Now when it comes to the evolution and where it starts to pick up, of course, you're gonna have the interchangeable parts. This one comes with a muzzle brake instead of just a, uh, a threaded muzzle with a little uh, crown protector on there. And this one is more precise. I can say that pretty definitively. This one seems to produce groups about 30% tighter, 25% tighter, somewhere in there. Uh, just overall, even when I was just shooting at targets out at long range, or whether it was the, uh, the clay pigeons or whatever, I could always tell that this one was just a little bit more on cue. I could feel this thing just really zeroing in and taking out those small targets. One more thing to keep in mind, the Savage Evolution is available in left hand. A lot of the other competitors, including the Savage Model 10 GRS, are not. And then if I could leave you with one last thing to think about, the AR parts here, yes, they're gonna be swappable. You know, like I mentioned, all these guys with their chassis systems, they're going to have these AR parts you can swap out, but you are also dealing with a Savage here, so you have all kinds of other parts you can swap as well. There's a pretty good aftermarket for Savage right now, and it seems to be getting better by the day. If you did wanna trade the, the awesome trigger that's in here, that two pound crisp trigger, to something that you think is even better, you can do that. And you can also, of course, swap out the barrel. You can do it right from your own garage with a handful of tools. And if you wanna to go to a bowl barrel, if you wanna to go to a different taper, a different uh, chambering, a different style, maybe a different uh, grade, then yeah, you can feel free to swap those out anytime. Savages are really fun and easy to work on. And that's one of the extra things that I think this brings to the market. Thanks for watching. If you liked this video, be sure to like, share, and most importantly, subscribe. Even if you didn't like this particular content, go ahead and subscribe. There's probably something coming that's more up your alley. Check out this playlist right here. This is going to have videos in a similar vein to what you just watched. These two videos we cherry picked for you. And finally, The Social Regressive is on Patreon. So you can become a patron of the destructive arts and earn some goodies while helping us to provide high quality videos just by kicking us a few bucks a month. Thanks a bunch for your patronage.